Arrakis, Dune, Book Club, Episode 1, A Box Full of Ow, of Animals, Humans and Machines. Welcome to Peppers and Glowworms, a channel dedicated to hot chili peppers and coldly glowing glowworms. <coughs> Welcome to the first real episode of the Dune Book Club. We start off with the first book called Dune, which is split in three different sections. And the first one is Book One Dune, confusingly enough. And there we have the very first chapter, uh, which I have dubbed a box full of Ow, with the title of Animals, Humans and Machines. The setting is Caladan, the homeworld of the Atreides, or more specifically Castle Caladan, where the Atreides family lives. In this chapter, Lady Jessica, uh, which doesn't seem uh, very important in this chapter, is only described in relation to Paul, uh, Paul's mother. She brings her son, Paul Atreides, before the Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohiam. Uh, an old hag with silvery teeth, and uh, she might secretly originate from Canada, eh? But anyway, she tests Paul's humanity, as it is uh, the Bene Gesserit way, and spoiler alert, uh, not really, he does not fail. And Paul is described uh, physically in this chapter, which is a little bit interesting, uh, face oval, strong bones, Uh, the hair is described as black black, with a brow line of the maternal grandfather who cannot be named, wink wink, nudge nudge, thin disdainful nose and green eyes. So I guess uh, none of the uh, uh, screen adaptations uh, got it right. He's also, uh, according to the quote from Princess Irulan at the beginning of the chapter, you can infer that he has to be 15 years old at this point. So again, <clears throat> not really in the movie adaptations. Well, maybe the latest one was closest. Oh yeah, and Jessica is also described via Paul, oval face like Jessica's. Yeah, so that's the basic summary of the chapter and mention of the protagonists. So now let's get into it. I will start with a quote from the actual chapter, not uh, the quote at the beginning of the chapter, which is uh, in-universe history, basically. So I chose uh, this quote to represent the chapter. Let us say I suggest you may be human, she said. That's a very topical, I guess. Uh, the more obvious quote would have been, what's in the box? Pain, which is uh, basically mimetic at this point, I think. And another nice quote is actually um, this one here. Paul felt that he had been infected with terrible purpose, which is a nice sign of the things to come. But it is uh, only hinted at this point. The whole uh, saga, what with uh, you cannot escape fate, or can you, or should you, or it's, is it difficult, or... Right. Yeah, the uh, quote at the beginning is also a bit amusing to me after having read through all kinds of Dune stuff, because it states that uh, Paul was uh, born on Caladan, and uh, the new Dune books retconned that he was actually born on Kaitan, uh, the imperial world at at the time at least um, but this can be explained away why princess irulan wouldn't know that know this because it's in universe but uh, it was a point of uh, irritation for the fans i guess when this came up in the new june books i guess it was uh, house atreides because i skipped on Paul of Dune. Uh, okay, now this with this minor nitpick out of the way, um, let's get into the real interesting stuff about the chapter. I'll be mostly talking about 
stuff that reminds me of other sci-fi franchises uh, makes me think of them but there's also some other interesting uh, topics uh, brought up that i want to mention for example um, on page eight at least in the version that i have um, the reverend mother complains in her thoughts um, that the lady jessica didn't give birth to a girl as she was ordered to and uh, you maybe wonder uh, 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 well if you haven't read dune you might be wondering uh, how can she be ordered to give birth to a girl um, well the Bene Gesserit have amazing uh, control over their body and they can even choose uh, the sex of their offspring uh, you re remember i'm talking about sex here not gender there's actually a little bit of science behind that fiction. Um, there are many, many ways of sex determination and sex change in nature. So I will restrict this discussion to uh, one specific mechanism. And that's the one that uh, we humans have. Uh, that is sex chromosomes. Uh, one uh, of them is a little bit reduced and looks different than the other. And this one determines the sex, basically. In humans, it's the little chromosome, the um, Y chromosome, that says you are going to be male. And in birds, it's uh, vice versa. There it's the little uh, reduced chromosome that says you are going to be a girl. So a female bird can potentially control the sex of its offspring by producing only egg cells that contain the right sex chromosome. For a female mammal, on the other hand, it's a little bit more complicated. It has to somehow control what type of sperm cell fuses with its own egg cells. Um, but even this uh, seems to be the case in nature. I uh, remember some studies that suggested that. So what I'm saying is that the Bene Gesserit probably uh, selects the right sperm cell in this case. And I think in later books that's uh, even mentioned or implied. Mechanisms of sex determination were actually the very first oral presentation I had to do back in the day when I was studying biology, uh, still with an overhead projector. So you can uh, somehow deduce how ancient I actually am. Uh, yeah, anyway, that was the first oral presentation I had to do. And so I have some fond memories uh, regarding this topic and it hit the right spot for me when I saw this mentioned in Dune. The next uh, point on my list in my notes is actually also related to my studies of biology because it is the litany against the fear, which was actually helpful uh, in my studies. Uh, when I was nervous one time, I started reciting it from memory and it actually helped. I was uh, no longer afraid of the test that I had studied for, but maybe that was just because I focused on something else, uh, not what I was uh, learning all these days uh, or weeks before this test just put me in a different place um, and it goes like this <clears throat> I must not fear fear is the mind killer fear is the little death that brings total obliteration I will face my fear I will permit it to pass over me and through me and when it has gone I will turn the inner eye to see its path where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. Those are some powerful words right there. The most prominent theme of this chapter, in my opinion, is uh, the difference between humans and animals, at least as far as the Bene Gesserit are concerned, uh, obviously not in a real-world taxonomic sense, uh, more on a philosophical level. Um, from my personal point of view, there's uh, no clear difference between uh, human and animal. Humans are, taxonomically speaking, animals, and there's no 
clear line of distinction. There are some things where humans are way, way uh, in another league than uh, any animal so far as we know. For example, as uh, planning for the future and stuff like that. And the usage of tools, but all of this can be found on some level in, in nature and um, no clear line between a human and animal. But uh, let's see how the Bene Gesserit see this difference. Uh, the first time that it comes up is when Paul uh, does a little practice uh, of one of the mind-body lessons that his Bene Gesserit mother has taught him. And there is uh, this uh, line of text. One does not obtain food safety freedom by instinct alone. Animal consciousness does not extend beyond the given moment, nor into the idea that its victims may become extinct. The animal destroys and does not produce. <clears throat> so uh, I guess um, most modern day humans would be considered animals by uh, the Bene Gesserit. Uh, moving on. Uh, animal pleasures remain close to sensation levels and avoid the perceptual. The human requires a background grid through which to see his universe. Focused consciousness by choice. This informs your grit. So, um, there's the first uh, vague idea about the difference between human and animal uh, on the Bene Gesserit uh, philosophical level. And later on, uh, that's the whole point of the test. To determine if Paul is human in the Bene Gesserit sense or not and he gets enraged uh, by the suggestion that the Duke's son may be an animal um, but uh, then comes the quote for the chapter that I mentioned uh, was, let us say I suggest you may be human which is uh, putting it more nicely and the Gomjabara, this poisoned uh, needle that she holds at his neck, well, it uh, it kills only animals, because uh, it kills those that fail the test. I don't think I have to explain the test to those uh, that have clicked on this video. Uh, maybe just briefly uh, put your hand in the box. It stays in the box. It hurts like effing hell, uh, but it must stay in the box or the Gomjaba goes prick and you're dead. And there's an interesting uh, quote that I remember a bit different. Um, the Reverend Mother says uh, with the analogy of the of an animal that is uh, caught in a has caught his leg in a trap and gnaws it off to get free again. Uh, she says that's an um, animal kind of trick and that a human would remain in the trap and endure the pain, feigning death, um, so that he may kill the trapper. And that was the quote, uh, the, the section that I remembered, but it goes on and it goes on like this and remove a threat to his kind. So it's uh, a bit more honorable when I, what I had in mind was just a Okay, a human is just a vengeful, spiteful little prick that risks his own or risks uh, its own life uh, just to get spiteful revenge. But uh, there's a bit more altruism to it, which is uh, the Bene Gesserit Creed, which uh, has not been mentioned so far, but it is uh, we live to serve, if I remember correctly. So this is more in line with the Bene Gesserit's uh, M.O. So yeah, um, a human would end your pain and do something for the greater good. It seems that that is what is meant. Yep. Yeah, and uh, it's mentioned that a human can override any nerve in the body, so uh, this whole body control thing seems to play into it quite heavily and the Bene Gesserit uh, sift people like uh, one would sift sand through a screen and they do this to find the humans among the animals. Uh, when Paul asks if 
that's all there is to it, just pain. And she, the Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother, explains that pain is merely the axis of the test, uh, that the test is crisis and observation. And when Paul asks why they do this test for humans, they say to set them free. And that's when the uh, Baudelairean Jihad thing is uh, brought up. Because uh, when the machines, the thinking machines were banned, uh, the human beings were forced to uh, develop their minds and uh, the crutch of thinking machines was removed and that's also playing into the breeding program of the Bene Gesserit, or the, the ideals of the Bene Gesserit. The Bene Gesserit are a school founded to train human talents and uh, they saw a need for continuity um, and this could only be achieved by separating human stock from animal stock for breeding purposes and then there's it again their breeding program to create the quizzard satarak so i think the benders would mean that a human being is able to move above its basic instincts and to have high control for body and mind and I think maybe these, um, this more altruistic behavior could be implied from that. Yeah. It makes one think. Hmm. Moving on with more lighter topics, I think, I hope. Okay, now it's time for the segment I called From Other Memory, where I uh, talk about things that reminded me of other sci-fi franchises or just sci-fi tropes in general. And the first one is uh, pain by nerve induction or as TV tropes uh, likes to refer to it. Agony Beam. The intro uh, is actually quite funny so I will just uh, Read it out loud from the TV Tropes web page. <coughs> There's a special place in the heart of sci fi and fantasy geeks for the Agony Beam, usually because it's carved that chunk out of our collective heart and crawled into the resulting cavity. Despite being an old staple that's used to the brink of cliche and back. It still sees widespread use and continues to serve a useful purpose, causing PG-rated pain on victims, much like an evil version of the Paralyzer. Yeah, so it's uh, very, very uh, common in uh, fiction. The first things that came to my mind uh, um, were uh, from Star Trek, when Captain Picard gets it once from artifact thieves and also when he's interrogated by a nice little Cardassian fellow who likes to know how many light he's seeing. Ah, fond memories of fun little episodes of good old Star Trek. Ah, uh, yeah. Of course, it's uh, very common in, uh, in Star Trek alone it comes up a bunch, a bunch, a bunch. Another very iconic use of the trope comes to my mind from Babylon 5, when the Inquisitor wants to get some basic facts from Dylan and Sheridan, and uh, he has a way to do this. And then in Warhammer 40k there's Rogel Dorn and his beloved Pain Glove. I'm not sure, I don't think Dune is the originator of the trope. Uh, I guess not. But it's quite iconic, you know, uh, this scene where Paul puts his hand in the box and <laughs> in the David Lynch uh, screen adaptation goes, oh, the pain! Oh, and funnily enough, TV Tropes mentions Capsaicin in the real life section of the webpage. And very fitting to this channel. Hmm? Another thing that reminds me of other sci fi franchises is the whole AI bad shtick. Uh, first brought up here in this chapter, there's mention of the Butlerian Jihad, and, uh, which caused the ban on thinking machines. Uh, they are not referenced as this 
by name in this chapter. It's only the quote from the Orange Catholic Bible that says, Thou shalt not make a machine in the likeness of a man's mind, which the uh, Bene Gesserit Reverend Mother corrects. Uh, it should have said, uh, Thou shalt not make a machine to counterfeit a human mind. So that's the rule, and uh, of course this makes me think of uh, Warhammer 40k again, which heavily borrowed from Dune in many aspects of its world building. Uh, I think it's quite apparent. Uh, the AI stands for Abominable Intelligence in Warhammer 40k. And funnily enough again, in the prequel novels to Dune uh, from the son of Frank Herbert and another author, the Baudelarian Jihad is depicted and it, in retrospect it feels more, a bit more like Warhammer 40k than Dune with all the robots going pew pew and all the bloodshed and the brains in walk, uh, giant walking machines and uh, yeah. That's uh, it goes full circle, it seems. <laughs> and speaking of modern attempts in classic franchises, the first season of Star Trek Pick <coughs> Star Trek Pick <coughs> Star Trek Picard. <coughs> <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> um. Yeah, there the ban on AI was also uh, very prominently featured. Uh, I'm not sure if I even watched uh, until the end, but uh, I got the gist of it from uh, raging reviews. <laughs> and uh, it seems uh, that they may have been very, very much inspired by a video game, a Mass Effect, I think. I'm not quite sure. Uh, and maybe Mass Effect was inspired by Dune, hmm, maybe, hmm. but if, it, it's not that much of an original idea to have a ban on thinking machines. Oh yeah, and one other stupid thing in Star Trek <coughs> in this series was uh, that uh, apparently it was just uh, intelligent robots that were banned, but uh, holograms were okay. Oh, it's such, such a stupid series. Uh, moving on. Another sci-fi trope that is very briefly and extremely vaguely brought up in this first chapter of Dune is genetic memory. It's not mentioned by name and only implied how it works, so uh, if you only read this little passage, uh, you would not think it has to be genetic memory. It's referred to as a body's memory. Um, and it's said that they can only look into the feminine avenues, the Bene Gesserit, that is. And of course, they are breeding program to create the Kwisat Tzadarak, uh, the female version of a reverend mother that can look into both avenues, female and male. Um, but it's not clear that genetic memory is uh, how it works from this little passage. But it is there. That is the very first mention in, in Dune of this uh, genetic memory stuff. And the first thing that makes me think of is the Alien franchise, funnily, funnily enough. Uh, back in the day when Alien Resurrection came out, the good old days when I was getting upset by just a flimsy little writing workaround uh, of why Ripley should remember her past. They said, well, she inherited genetic memory from the alien. Uh, of course, this doesn't really make sense because if she inherited the genetic memory of, from the alien, wouldn't she remember the memories of the aliens and not her human memories? Uh, I had fan theory theories uh, developed on this. Uh, I thought maybe this implies that the fetus of the alien is in telepathic contact with the host and absorbs its memories and uh, she can only remember the human memories because the alien memories are too alien and uh, all sorts of things like this. Uh, I 
thought about and uh, this was actually once uh, uh, started a writing draft for a video some years ago but I um, gave up on it and yeah those were the good old days when I could get upset by such a minor little thing and now uh, look how the alien franchise is standing right now Yeah, that was another video that I once scheduled or started to think about uh, a, 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 an eulogy on the Alien franchise. But uh, there's also a series in development, I think. Uh, I guess it can only get worse. Uh, I guess, uh, yeah, after Alien Resurrection, it went down, down, down. But the soundtrack of Alien Covenant was nice. And... Uh, Michael Fassbender's acting was uh, good uh, to hilarious, but it, it shouldn't uh, have been an alien movie. No. Okay, getting off topic. Uh, uh, the concept of genetic memory flimsily uh, or with uh, not very much of science in the fiction uh, comes up quite often in uh, franchises that I consume and tends to spoil it for me a bit because it's so uh, uh, lazily adopted or without much thinking about it. Um, just a lazy hand wave to get some plot inconveniences out of the way. Yeah. Oh yeah, and if you want an example of genetic memory done right, I have to say the orcs are the best. Specifically, the orcs of Warhammer 40k, they are an artificially created race of warriors. And it makes sense in universe that they have this genetic memory thing and it it's just mwah, chef's kiss. Really done well and also very funny. What with the, uh, the odd boys and the uh, weird boys and all those... Uh, specializations that they have really good hmm there are still some segments on my list uh, one that uh, i decided to add after the last video the primer to the book club is a tally of paul's abilities um, and in the end i will check if he's a mary sue maybe um, so we have prophetic dreams uh, quote he always remembered the dreams that were predictions. And he is a truth sayer. In uh, Dune terms, uh, this uh, basically means truth seer uh, would be more accurate, I think, because it means that a person can detect lies. Quote You know when people believe what they say, she said. I know it. So, he has prophetic dreams and he can tell lies from truth. Or at least if the person thinks it is a truth. And the final segment for now, worm signs. How many times did the great sandworm of Dune, or the organism with all its life stages, get mentioned by name? Can you guess? Do you know? It was... Zero. Mm -hmm. I do not get to consume any hot stuff. As I explained in my primer video, every time the great sandworm is mentioned by name, I will consume one little spicy bit of dried little chili pepper, some hot sauce, some chili powder, or whatever I have around. But not this time. See you for chapter 2, maybe, if you like. But anyway, she tests human blah blah blah, blah humans polarity. Whatever.